a chance to really look at this specific Notre Dame team. But I was curious, what is it that's allowed Mike's offense to be so efficient over the years? Uh, well, I think he's, one, is a very good coach. I think he's a very good offensive coach, defensive coach as well. But to me, the thing that stands out the most about Notre Dame's teams, and not just this year, I think is what you're asking, is that the guys that can shoot the best, they get most shots. And the guys that are good offensive players, um, the things that they run are designed to get those players the ball in the right situations. It's uh, uh, we do a lot of freelance, and we have to talk a lot about is that the best shot for our team? You know, let's, let's get a shot that everybody wants. And I think that uh, that's a key to an offensive team. And I think that Mike's guys have done that uh, really, really well about. Getting a shot that everybody on the team wants to take, whether it's Vasturi or Bonzi inside or Farrell or whoever he's had over the years. And then uh, defensively, they, they can play your zone, they can play your man and, and do a good job. And the thing that I uh, did watch their game against uh, Georgia Tech a couple of nights ago, and you lose Bonzi and you don't have Matt there, and that's your two biggest keys offensively. And so all of a sudden, they really trying to <coughs> defend and rebound. And, trying to find a different way to win and sort of just hanging around to the end and being able to make a play at the end of the game. And that's it's been pretty impressive. Is that kind of the scary part that someone, quote, unknown is going to come up and yeah. bite you? Is that yeah, you know, I don't know if Matt's going to play uh, tomorrow or not, but uh, Bonzi is, is, you guys know, preseason pick for player of the year, and I think uh, rightfully so. And Matt's just gotten better and better and better. I remember when we first started playing, I thought, man. And then he just kept getting better. I thought it was sensational for him last year. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you know, Fluger goes 0 for 8. You don't think that's going to happen the next game. You know, you hope that you don't get it balanced out and go 8 for 8, so he's back to shooting 50%. But, uh, they've got a good basketball team and, and, and have had, since they came to the league, I think they've been one of the top teams in the league all the time. Seems when you know, obviously when Theo gets gets in the lanes, able to distribute and find people and outside and inside, the offense works so much better. Mm -hmm. you any conversations with him about just focusing on that aspect of this game? And what kind of goes into getting him to do that? Because he looked like that against Boston College. Yeah, it, it was a good game, good game for him because he also I think he had eight rebounds. Yeah, I mean the thing with Theo, he's got to make plays. But he's got to rebound the basketball too, and you make plays by being excited about playing, that your energy level is really at a high level. And uh, we need to be able to do that. We need him to drive the ball to the basket and make plays. We need him to get the ball off the board and bust out. Uh, and I think his activity level, a couple of games at Virginia and Florida State, both were not a very high level. That's what we talked about. He needed to play better. And I think he had the energy right from the start uh, in the Boston uh, college game. His defensive grade, he had more good defensive plays than he had in the last three games combined. I think he had more rebounds in that game than he had both at Virginia and Florida State. So he was just more involved, and that's what we needed to be. How is Seth progressing? I have no idea. I mean, he's dribbling the ball now and walking around. But you know, it's, uh, I think uh, sometime soon they're going to take another, another MRI and see what it looks like. But he's not doing anything. This, He's not, not walking with crutches, he's not walking with the boot, he's walking normally. Uh, he doesn't appear to be having any pain. He stands there and does a lot of dribbling around during practice. Coach, how would you uh, compare this year's team from the free throw line so far this year to years past? Oh, you know, we've shot, had some games where we really shot them well, but I, I, couldn't have, I couldn't have a clue. If you tell me this team is shooting five percentage points higher than last year, I'll say, okay. If you tell me they're shooting five percentage points less, I'll say, okay, because I don't really compare that stat from one year to the next. I, a lot of times compare stats about our defensive field goal percentage or our rebound margin or something like that. But, uh, but I really I don't talk very much about free throws. Just go make the sucker and that's it. I know you said you weren't married to that lineup you used the other night, but what did you, after you looked it over, how did you assess that? Well, I thought the, the most positive thing is that we did still rebound the ball very well. And then the other thing is I think that Garrison and uh, Sterling, particularly when they got in the game, they still had some good moments. So they didn't pout, they didn't whine and sit over and act like they weren't ever going to play. They had good moments when they were in the game. So I like that part of it. And I, th I think, again, uh, 
we've we've played that lineup uh, since Cam got back. You know, we didn't play without Cam, but since Cam got back, we've played that several times during the game, and I've I felt pretty comfortable with it. But at the same time, I want to make sure that I give particularly Harrison, Sterling, Huff, the big Walker, the big guys, some minutes to help in their development down the road. We talk about rebounding. Do you, do you feel pretty confident that that group can get that done well enough on the boards, or do you just not know? Don't know. Yeah. I'm not that confident about it, but uh, that's the reason we keep emphasizing it, try to make sure that they emphasize it enough themselves. Coach, two questions from Andrew Jones, who's already traveling. One is, um, it looked as though Luke was the beneficiary of the smaller lineup, but how did it help Theo? Well, again, I'll go back. I don't think the lineup helps Theo. I think Theo helps Theo. I mean, I really do. You just you watch the tape from those other two games, and he was not very active. Uh, the good thing about the lineup is that you look at uh, Theo was 5-0 assist error ratio, Cam was 5-0, and Joel was 3-0. So uh, we also had some drives to the basket, so we opened up the lane a little bit instead of having two post players in there. That in itself might have helped Theo, but uh, that acts like a coaching decision. Helped Theo, Theo helped Theo himself because he played better. And the second question is, how did Garrison handle not starting? And are there things, obviously, with your experience when you're talking to a player, who has started every game his freshman year, now all of a sudden there's a lineup change. He handled it fantastically. I didn't see any problem with him whatsoever. I talked to him about it and uh, uh, told him he was still going to play and we still needed him to be important to us, and he really accepted that. Thank you. How has Cam kind of meshed in with the team in the lineup? He's still pretty you know, four or five games into mm -hmm. his career. Have you notice anything about how it affects it good or bad with Kenny or Joel or, or Theo? I think they really like him. He really likes it. Uh, some of our best ball movement has been since he's got back in the line, it gives us another shooter and they trust him. And, and he's completely unselfish too. I mean, he gives it up and it's amazing. It goes boom, 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 and somebody ends up with a good shot. And it may be Cam, it may be Joel, it may be Kenny, but uh, I think that it's been done both ways. I think he's really. Uh, did a nice job of trying to blend in, and I think everybody's really accepted it. You mentioned the other night the idea of guys hear things and they want to, you know, they want to do well, but mm -hmm. around here if things don't go well, they start hearing it. Do, do you think the other night maybe we're eased a little bit of, I don't know, tell everybody to relax a little bit after the way they played the other night? I think it depends on how we play each and every game. I, <laughs> things, as I really do. I mean, you go to South Bend, you know, or we won't be able to coach a lick again. You know, <laughs> poorly and uh, uh, players are dumb and they don't play hard enough. It's, it's a little bit of what it is, but it's college basketball where you have the tremendous interest that we have too. But I think if that, that to me will be judged, evaluated differently after every game. Do you see that criticism at all? I mean, no. I, you know, I'm, well, I'm sure I see some, but you know, when you're tooling around in the message board. Yeah. <laughs> you don't stop on those? Oh, really? I find that hard to right. believe. I found there was a, this is a couple of years ago, there was a question on the rules test that all the coaches have to take. It was unfair. <laughs> they were talking about stuff I didn't even know what the crap they were talking about. How can you give an answer when you're talking about message board and uh, flash drive? Flat, yeah, that's what it was. I, I didn't know if that was x rated movie or what the crap it was. <laughs> But uh, you know, I thought that was a very unfair question. But to answer your question, uh, I, I've gotten so over the years that uh, I really don't read very much about our team. And if, uh, if the staff feels like it, I really need to see something, I think they think pretty deeply before they hand it to me as well. <laughs> the same with Curse. I mean. But uh, I don't get, uh, I've really gotten good with the phone. Because I, 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 y'all laugh, but I'm serious. Come on now. I have an ESP and a app, and I can turn it on, and it gives me, uh, I got tennis, Major League Baseball, NCAA basketball, NBA, so every night I hit the NCAA basketball, and I check all the scores, and if I want to check the box score again, and I hit the NBA to see how our kids did, and then I always check Major League Baseball, I look, check the PGA Tour, and I check Major League Baseball, so I don't have to stay up and watch the late sports center anymore, but I just do it on my phone, so I go, I'm stepping up in the world. <laughs> didn't Coach Smith get all the clippings from everything that was ever written on his team? Is that, is yeah. that right? Be hard the to reason do. I know that really well because my first few years as a part-time assistant, that was my job. <laughs> One of my jobs. We got 32 papers a day. And I went through every paper every day. <coughs> Excuse me. 
to go for Christmas break and you have three or four days and you got 96 papers. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd cut everything out, you know, and it'd be the hometown papers of prospects would be, and then all the other <coughs> papers, and the paper from Charlottesville, the paper from Georgia Tech, and <coughs> I'd get them on I me mean, two or three hours every day. I'd just tackle them, put them on Eddie Fogler's desk, he'd look at me and he'd take them and put them on Coach Guthridge's desk. But I think Coach Smith read a lot of it. But uh, uh, I just, I don't do it. It'd be hard to read every tweet with your name in it. It'd be a hard thing to do. I have much. no idea, you know, because I'm, I'm serious. I don't know if it's tweet or twit. I don't know which one you're talking about. But uh, I like my life where it's not governed by <coughs> looking at a phone or looking at a computer all the time. Did you do that at Kansas? When you first got the job, did you have an assistant that put things for you then when you first started? Yeah, when I first started, I didn't think I was getting very much out of it. it was, uh, for me, it was time It was time consuming. And, uh, you know, I, I still liked getting things from the prospects, hometown newspapers, see how they were playing or something like that. But now it's all the recruiting stuff, not all, but a huge majority of it to me is done in the off season with the summer circuit. The, AU tournaments, the Nike events, the Adidas events, uh, all those things. And so it's not as much a hometown coverage of a hometown kid. Anybody else? Do you remember the first time Coach Smith advanced the theory that teams can survive without their star for one game? Notre Dame's kind of testing a little bit. Yeah. Little bit here. Oh, gosh, I can't remember the first time, but I do think that, you know, and I've, and I've tried to use that myself if we have a guy go down. And, you know, come on, guys! Everybody's got to raise their level, of play a little bit. We got to make up. Joe's not here, so you know, we got to we got to raise your level. We got to get four more offensive rebounds from you, and four more for you. That make up for, for Joe being out or something like that. But uh, uh, coach really believed in that, and I saw it happen uh, myself enough to make me think it's a pretty good deal too. That they can uh, rally. It's almost like a rally around each other. Say, hey, let's play our tails off until so and so gets back. And, not lose anything. It's obviously more than one game, but Notre Dame without Ponzi, what have you kind of noticed from them? How I think they adjusted? Yeah, they've done a great job of adjusting, and it's hard to do that over long term with this with the skills and the talent that Ponzi for example. I don't Matt either one. You know, I don't know if Matt's going to play Saturday or not, but Ponzi shooting over 50 cents, averaging a double double over 20 and over 10. And, and everybody in the league, when you started talking about playing Notre Dame, your first thing that you wanted to think about is what to do about Monzi. So over the course of time, you know, getting the guys together mentally and raising their level of play is harder to do over a length of time than it is for one game or something like that. You look forward to these games. I do because last week was the opposite end of the spectrum in the ACC and how mm -hmm. a team plays. Notre Dame is right in your kitchen though, my man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a very good cook either, so let's not put them in my kitchen. I enjoy, uh, I enjoy the ACC. I enjoy the level of play that you have. It is, as you've heard me say many times, a marathon filled with 400 meter dashes or something like that. Uh, I have 20 and I have 14 or whatever it is, but I don't enjoy getting there for that. Uh, but uh, we've played at Notre Dame, I guess, two different years? Twice. Twice, yeah. And I do. I enjoy going to play in uh, places like that. And uh, the league is league is fun, uh, but it's a heck of a lot more fun if your team's good and you're playing well. Because if it's not, it just beats you down every single day. You gotta you gotta have your A game, or you want to go home with a, with a loss. Uh, but uh, Mike Bray is a, uh, he's really a good guy, and I enjoy seeing a bunch of the coaches too. I gotta tell him he's he's, he's a better man, bigger man, or a dumber man. I don't know which one. I, but walking in that locker room without a shirt on, celebrating him, my boy, he was my hero. That day. <laughs>